read Luke 15, 11 through 32. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you died. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a robe for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older bro brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Those words comprise probably the most famous story of Jesus. Now, Jesus said a lot of amazing things, and many of them captured, and many of them captured in analogies and illustrations, sometimes just one remarkable phrase. But in this story, you maybe find Jesus' greatest story. In fact, ever since the time Jesus shared that story, uh, people have been alluding to it, drawing from it, century after century. Authors, playwrights, poets, uh, even Shakespeare, some of the most famous in every century, make allusions to this, this story of this father and these brothers. Even artists would form their own depiction of it, century after century. Even Rembrandt, one of the most famous artists, who really told his life story and where he was in different pockets of life by the art he produced. And one of his final works was a painting of the prodigal son-father story. 
And in it, he said, it, this, is, this is really what most captures my heart. It's this most famous story of Jesus. And I'm really grateful that today we get to not really just listen to it, but certainly listen to it and then also have an experience with it. Uh, Jesus told stories that were unquestionably entertaining, sometimes culturally funny, but always inviting people, inviting his listeners to some type of experience, to, to have some type of encounter with him in the story. It always had a point. And inside this story, what you really find, it seems pretty obvious, right, is there are, you, you could say there are three really prominent characters in this story of, of Jesus, right? There's three prominent characters, and I want to look each one of them for a little bit today and just see a little deeper into their, into their lives and in the picture Jesus is trying to paint. And while there are three really prominent figures in the story, some obvious ones, there's, there's, a, fourth, there's a fourth character in the story that, that isn't uh, quite as, as obvious. And then there's actually a fifth character in the, the story that often just gets missed. And I'll just tell you at the beginning, we don't have time to talk about the fifth one today. And so maybe some other day you'll come back and we'll talk about that. Okay. But the first and the obvious, the most prominent character in the story is the prodigal son. And we'll, we'll just use this, this little space in this stool to maybe just give us a constant little reminder of this, this youngest son. And this youngest son, he, he does something absolutely unthinkable in the day. And he goes to his father and he, he, he says, You're, right, hey, I want my share of your inheritance, I want your share of my inheritance. And how the inheritance would have worked in the first century was, uh, would have been divided equally uh, among the boys of the day. And so we know from the story, right, there are two sons. And so this, this son, when he says, I want, I want my share of the inheritance right now, what he's really saying is, I want one third of all of your worth. I know two-thirds is going to go to my older brother, but I want one-third of all of your worth, Father. I know that I'm supposed to wait until you pass away, but I want one-third right now. One-third right now. And what you got to understand is that for the father in the day, that is not like go write a check or move some funds around in a retirement account. That is to take all of his estate, his land, his belongings whatever livestock he had, and he has to sell a third. He has to literally unload a third to get the, the money that he can get in return for that third, and then he can hand this son the inheritance. Now, now there's a couple things. The, the, the mere question is one of the most disrespectful, dishonoring questions a son could have asked. It is, com it is completely disrespectful. It's, it's the son's way of saying, really, um, hey, dad, this might be good, but I could do it better on my own, okay? Now, all of us in our growing up years have had moments of that thought, right? No matter how great your parents were or weren't. And if you are in your growing up years, I, hopefully you're smart enough to not actually say it to your parents, right? But we all have the moment, Right? Well, this son, he, he says, and again, it's disrespectful, it's dishonoring, not just in general, but in the culture, it would have been completely magnified. The father didn't have to do it. Father didn't have to do it, and yet he, he does. He goes through the process of selling land. Now, again, if you could feel Jesus' story and what's really happening there, uh, think about the time between the ask and the sell. This son has not been just disrespectful. He's created a ton of work for his dad. On top of navigating the family, leading the family, leading the, 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 the farm and whatever they had of the day, now he's got to try and actively sell it. He's got to really make sure all the resources are accounted for. He's got to go find a buyer. He's, and he has completely thrown the family 
into an unbelievably awkward time. Okay? Now, every time that that son passes somebody the father works for, that worker could think, look, my job might be on the line because you asked for the inheritance early, and now the father's got to sell. And I don't know, like, am I part of the third that's going to lose my job because you wanted your third? Think about every time, like, he passes his dad, and maybe the dad hopes, Are you, have you, have you, have you changed, changed your mind? Have you changed your mind? Have you cha- do you still think you know better, right? It's awkward. Imagine every family dinner is awkward. Every discussion feels awkward. But the father does it. He does it. In spite of the disrespect and the dishonoring, in spite of the extra work created that should have been in the future somewhere, in spite of the incredibly awkward conversations and relational dynamics that have been thrust onto the table, the father does it. He sells everything. And you heard, like, you heard what the, the son who thinks he knows better how to steward the money and the resource does. He goes and he squanders it, right? He, he goes and he wastes it. He takes what really is supposed to be the launching pad of his life and in independence, and he wastes it. He wastes it. Well, why, does he, why does he waste it? Well, he wastes it. Because he's a little over eager to get what is not yet really something he can handle fully. He, he wastes it because he thinks he knows better how to use it than the father who had actually cultivated and grown it over a lifetime. So he squanders it. And he finds himself in this incredibly difficult time. And he's starting to sit with no money left, no food left, no opportunity left, nobody to hire him left, nobody. And when you get to that point, he, you, you think... But, you start doing even more desperate things. And he says, okay, I'm going to rehearse this little speech. I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to like, do the rehearse speech thing. And that's really when, when we get our first like, real, real look at the father. See, it's easy to miss the father and the son's question and the work that comes with it. And the way, but, but we've seen a little bit what the son has created. We've seen the dishonor, the disrespect, the, the, the certain pain and agony, the disappointment, the heartache that, that the son has caused the father. But when the son starts coming back, we get our first look at this father, this first like tangible look. And what we find is that somehow, while still, again, leading his family, guiding his employees, navigating the business, dealing with his own heartache and pain of being disrespected and dishonored and, and, and not loved well, while doing all of that, somehow, somehow, this father has it in him to still be like looking and watching for the son. Like just watching, staring off into the distance, moving some cattle, some sheep, looking into the distance, having a family meal and watching, like looking, is there any sign that maybe my, my son is coming back? We have no idea how long it was. Jesus doesn't paint a time frame. It, it could have been a week. It could have been a decade. We don't know. But somehow he, he watches, and when the son comes back, When the son comes back, the father really has an unthinkable response. It sounds neat because it's in the Bible, but it's unthinkable. Number one, it's unthinkable that he's even still watching. I mean, the the level of forgiveness that must be a part of that, the level of healing that must be part of that. But then, did you hear what he did? Like the father... The father ran to where the son was. He runs to greet the son who has dishonored him so tangibly. Do you know what the father has to do to, to run to him? The father has to actually like pick up his, his, his clothes. He's got to pick up this robe that he would be wearing. He has to pick up these, these clothes because it's all long and flowing and by his feet. It makes it almost impossible to run. And so he has to pick it up a little bit. And then when he picks it up a little bit, a couple of things happen. Number one, he shows, now don't get too shocked in Paul here, but he shows his bare legs. Okay. This wasn't a shorts culture. This, you know, this, this wasn't a Burke's culture. This wasn't a, right, okay. 
And so he picks this thing up and he shows his bare legs, which a man, especially a father in the culture, that was taboo. You don't do that. And then on top of that, he runs in public. Men, fathers, didn't run in the culture because, because it showed this, this hurry. It showed this something might be out of control. They, they, they were above the running. And so, listen to this. L- listen, you got, you, got, you got to see this. Listen. This son who so tangibly dishonored his father, when he reaches his bottom and he is coming back, the father picks up his rope and runs, and in doing so, dishonors himself. Culturally, dishonors himself to get back to the son. Culturally does something that people would have been like, oh, ooh, no, hey, uh-uh, nope. But he so misses his son, he so loves his son, that he will run in his direction. And he gets there, and he doesn't even really give the son a great chance to get through the rehearsed speech, right? Isn't that, isn't that great? Like, okay. Look, you've already spent all the money. Stop talking. Okay. Instead, he hugs him. He embraces him. He calls for the best robe. The best robe in the family would have always been the father's. Go get my robe. Go get my robe. My son is asking me to treat him like a slave or like a servant. I'm going to do everything I can to remind him, no, 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 We're best when you're my son. We're best when you're my son. You're best when you're my son. I'm best when I get to be your father. So he says, go get my robe. I'll hug him. I'll embrace him. I'll put my robe on him. I will cover up the marks and the the scars and the wounds from the sin and from the thinking he knew better and from the rebel. I'll cover all of that. There's this whole other piece that we don't have time to get into where really the father running to him too to meet him really more outside the farm and more towards the edge of the city would have protected the son from so much accusation and shame that people at the city gate would have wanted to heap on him. Father's doing everything he can to extend all of this this, this grace. And what an incredible picture of this, this father whose son dishonored him, disrespected him, didn't convey love well, didn't, didn't trust him. Honestly, at the end of the day, was just selfish, right? That, I mean, I just call it what it is. He was just selfish. And we, like, we get that. At least we should, right? We get that. If you don't think you've ever been selfish, ask the person you're sitting next to. They'll help you, okay? Right? I mean, we've all done it, Right? And the father, like, experiences that, feels that. This isn't, a, like, a transaction. This is a relational event. And yet still, like, watches and responds with all this grace. And all the while that's happening, there's this, this older brother there's the, the, the brother who's been around a, a little bit longer. And, and what you've what you got to understand, uh, the, older, the older brother here, um, while the younger brother has hurt and, and, and heartache and pain from what he's done, the older brother also has lost because of what the younger brother has done. You, you see, when, when, When the younger brother asks for his inheritance and the father sells it, okay, what what just happened? Well, what the father owns just went down in size. And when the father takes the younger son back, he's entitled to a second inheritance. He's entitled to a third of the new smaller family allotment. And so if you're tracking what just happened, the older brother who has been there the whole time just lost some of his inheritance. He just lost some of what he had before the younger brother left and came back. His younger brother's sin, disrespect, dishonor, and return, and his 
father's grace. It's like this older son, he's like, what in the world just happened here? What in the world just happened here? And so then you can start to understand, right, while he, why he struggles. <laughs> when he comes back from working in the field, which is what he does every day faithfully, gets everything done, when he comes back and he hears there's a party and it's for his younger brother, that only means, oh, he's not just back. He's back. He's not just back. He's actually back in as part of the family. He is back in or he is still a son. And it doesn't take long for this older brother to do the math on that inheritance. So you could maybe, maybe, maybe now you can understand the anger a little more, the frustration a little more. So here's this part. And think about, think about the contrast of what's, what happens when this, when this older brother, like, won't go in for the party, and he ends up in this conversation with the father, and he starts the conversation not with dad or father. He starts the conversation with, like, look, look here. Which is, which is really, again, you could make a case that still today, but culturally, it's unbelievably disrespectful. There's no acknowledge. He won't even call his father his father. He's so upset. And so if you can imagine him coming in, arms flailing in anger and frustration, making his case, all the while you can hear, just, just in the distance, you can hear the music in the party where while his arms are flailing in anger, people are dancing in joy. You, you can he- feel him coming in at the end of the day and he's hungry and he's worn out and he's ready and, and, and yet he's so angry that he's now caught in this argument while well, food that's at the party is within smell range. He knows, like, oh, okay. He's red with anger. I mean, if you could picture his face, you would see a brother red with anger, just despondent at what happened. While over here, just with, with an earshot, it's full joy. It's full celebration. And so he doesn't really know what to do with it. And so he's so upset, he's so despondent that he even engages in his own disrespect. And then, then, remember what he said? He said, look, I've done everything you've said. I've done everything you said. And now this brother of mine or this supposed son of yours who didn't do anything you said, who took everything, you just welcome him back? I've never asked for anything. I've never asked for anything. I've been perfect. I've been good. I've done it right. And you haven't, like, thrown me some kind of party. And what I hope you can feel in that moment in the conversation is much like when the the younger son asked for his inheritance and left in the father's heart would have cracked and broken. I hope you can feel it happening again. When the son who has always been there says, I've done everything you've asked. I've been perfect. Why why would you take what I have earned and do something different with it? And let's go back to the father. The father's response is incredible. The father's like, oh, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. You, you, you don't understand. You're, you're, my, you're my son. So everything I've owned the whole time has always been yours. I've always been open-handed to you. It's always been right here. If you wanted the goat, you just had to ask for the goat. If you wanted the sheep, you just had to ask for the sheep. If you wanted a party, you just had to ask for the party. It's always been right here. I, I've always been open, open-handed with you. I, I didn't take anything from you. I've given you everything. I've given you everything. And, 
And, and it's heartbreaking to the father because while he's been trying to give everything, this, this oldest son of his has still been trying to work for everything. And so what you have in the middle is this father who, like, like let this sink in a little bit. You have this father who at the same time, at one point was looking for one son who had left. He's looking for one son. And at the very same time, it's just holding his hand out open, everything he has to the other son. I'm looking for this son. I'm so glad you're here. Here's everything I have. I so want this one to come back. Man, just take what you have. Like, it's all ours. It's ours together. Here's my, man, I so want this son to come back. It's, it's a search. It's a desperate look and longing. And it's an open-handed, free heart, unbelievable generosity at the same time. And what we see in the Father It's the perfect picture of grace. It's the perfect picture of grace. I'll let you go. I will let you do your thing. And this is how we're born. I mean, we're born over here, youngest sonny, right? Like, I could do it better. I could do it, right? But I am, I am looking, looking, watching, 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 looking, 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 looking. And... When you're with me, you're with me. And when you're with me, what I am and what I have is what you are and what you have. Let me just play that one back for you again, okay? Because I can tell some of you didn't get it, okay? When, when, you're, when you're with me, you're, 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 you're with me. And when you're with me, what I am and what I have is what you are and what you have. That is incredible, incredible generosity and grace. See, see, what the son didn't understand is he was never going to earn it. He always had it. He was never going to earn something the father was always trying to give him. There's these three people. Like there's this youngest son. There's this, this oldest son. There is this father in the middle. Let's talk about a fourth person that often we might not see inside the story and we might miss in the story. The fourth person inside the story is actually you. You're, you're in the story. I'm in the story. You, you, you personally, you're in the story. I, as a human, am in the story. Jesus tells the story to onlookers, to people who are listening in, right? And the people who are listening in, all of them are represented in some level in one of those brothers. And so are you and me. Some of us, um, some of us, we, we've got an older brother life. We've lived an older brother life. We have been raised in good things. We have lots of religious upbringing. Uh, we maybe don't feel like we have some catastrophic story. And so we feel like we've done good things. We resonate with the older brother's statement of, hey, I've done it right. I've done it right. I've made good decisions. I've tried to honor you. I've tried to honor God. I've tried to honor my heavenly father. Like, I've done this thing right. And I want to do it right. I want to do it right. So I make sure I can like keep hold of heaven, even if I feel like I only have it by just one finger. I want to do it right so that I can like hope that, that God would bless me or keep blessing me. And I want to do it right, and I have done it right, which actually leads me to great dismay when there's any hardship in my life. Because I think if I'm doing it right, wait, haven't I earned this being easy and, and, and good? I'm doing it right because right is what gets you good. And some of us, we've, we've lived here. And the risk with here, listen, the risk with living here is that we can grow up and be around and be in for long periods of our life, religious environments, and do lots of good things and not understand
that we're actually sometimes unintentionally uh, using God a little bit. Uh, We're using his goodness. We're trying to buy it with our goodness. And we've prayed some prayers and we've marked some boxes and we've done some church things, but, but there's a risk that we can be all around it, never leave the family estate, and yet not actually take everything the Father has given us. Not what we think, even though we would never say it, that the Father might owe us. We're not employees, we're sons and daughters. We're not employees, we're sons and daughters. You're not an employee, you're made to be a son and a daughter. You're not a hired hand, you're made to be a son or a daughter. This son lived like an employee. All the good he did, all the church stuff he did, all the cleaning of the cattle he did, all the right, he lived like an employee. And what we see, like what we see in this son, and listen, this is some of us. Please, please hear me. It's okay. We got, we, the, Jesus tells one of, the, one of his greatest stories of all time to give us permission to deal honestly with where we might be. It's okay to acknowledge, and some of us need to acknowledge it, that, that this, this son has lots of sin too. This son has lots of sin too. When, when we've tried to like earn from God, misuse God, keep God in a little bit of a box in a way we can orchestrate and, and control and measure ourselves. Right? And what we see in this son is the same thing we see in this son. What we see in the older son was just as true in the younger son. And here's what's true about both of them in relationship to their father, and that is very simply this. Both of them, both of them valued the resources of the father more than relationship with the father. They both placed a higher priority on the resources of the father. What can I get early? What can I earn? What can I be entitled to? What am I due? What can I take and get my hands on early, what can I be paid? They, do, do you see how in both of them, there's great disregard for the father as the person, there's a disregard, there's a minimizing of the relationship? Both of them, in equal amounts, live valuing the resources of the father more than relationship with the father. Over here, Older son, right, what's he doing? He just wants the resources, so he'll be good. He'll try and do it right. He'll try and be perfect. He'll try and say the right prayer when it's not perfect so we can balance the scale back and I can still get my weekly paycheck of somehow feel good about something with God, right? Like, this is, this is, what, we, this is what we do. And it's like, it, like, let's just be okay. Some of us, this is all we were taught. It's all we ever saw. It's all we've ever had modeled for us. But part of the reason Jesus is pointing out in the story is because there's a bunch of religious people listening to him who are very, like, uncomfortable in the moment of hearing this. But the same is true with this son who just says, oh, look, like, yeah, over here, I just just want the stuff. Just give me the stuff, Dad. I don't really care about you. I actually know better than you. I'm out. When the son leaves, there's no thought that he's ever coming back. You understand that, right? There's no thought he's ever coming back. He only comes back when his best attempt at living with the inheritance crumbles right beneath his feet. He doesn't take it and say, okay, I'll be back in two years. He has no intention of coming back. Why? Because he valued the resources over the relationship. And so both, both live with like real extreme brokenness, right? Because the relationship with the father isn't really a family relationship. It's at best a business relationship. It's at best, uh, you, you know, like a go to the bank relationship. It's not a family relationship. And so in the middle of that, here's the father, like, right? And I say, hey, yeah, but look, when you go, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking, I'm searching. And while you're here, like, please, like, please, like everything I have is yours. Whatever I am and whatever I have is whatever you are and whatever you have. And here's the invitation of Jesus in it when he tells the story. 
It's to say, what seat have I sat in? And potentially, what seat am I sitting in? If you identify with the younger brother a little bit today, the really good news is that God is always watching, always looking, always ready to embrace and comfort and bring back and bring you into his family. It's always his response, every single time, always his response, always. And if you have found yourself saying, I don't know about God and I don't know if I could get to God, like you, I don't know, like look at what I've done. Jesus, Jesus intentionally painted the younger son's actions as some of the most broken things you would have been able to imagine in the culture, right? He didn't say, do you notice he didn't say, and that brother went out and he, and he told a small lie. No, went out, hired prostitutes, gambled, did the thing, get, right? It's just he, everything you could think, this is, what he, this is what he did. And the father still sprints towards him, does the unimaginable thing, and runs towards him. Maybe identify with, with this one. Hey, look, in our, in our culture, a lot of us need to understand this is us. We need to come to grips and be okay with that. This is us. And here's, here's, here's how you do it. Um, we get to a point where whichever son we identify with most, whichever brother we identify with, doesn't matter if it's the, the younger one who just, it's kind of overt and wild and crazy, or if it's the older one that's real, like, cleanly packaged, and everybody would look at it and say, man, they're a good, they're a good young man, they're a good, I mean, right? It doesn't matter which one it is. Here's what we got to understand. In both of them, in both of them, we, we need to, in a healthy way, without guilt and without shame and without weird senses of condemnation that leave us broken forever, we, we need to be okay to feel the weight of our sin. We need to be okay feeling the weight of our sin. On occasion, it's even helpful to remember, like if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you're like, man, I'm not that. I, I'm just all in with Jesus and I'm not that because I know it's only by his grace I have. Even for us, it's, it's helpful sometimes to just go back and review where we've been, not to beat ourselves up, but to celebrate what God has brought us out of. To remember how, listen, let, let me say it to you this way. Our appreciation of grace is directly influenced by our awareness of sin. Our appreciation, our absorption, our celebration, our acknowledgement, our sense of being overwhelmed by, our sense of our heart being captured by God's grace to us is directly influenced by our awareness of our sin. When we, listen, if we think our sin is too great, we'll feel like grace could never quite get to us. If we minimize it because we think we've done really well and our life doesn't have this big dramatic story, then we'll always sit in the very shallow end of the pool when it comes to grace. And listen, Listen, grace is the thing that changes everything. Great God is grace. God is grace. He is generosity. Grace changes everything. And so for some of us, the move is very simply today to put ourselves in that story, to put ourselves in the people who would have been out here listening to Jesus tell the story and just say, hey, look, where am I? Which brother am I most like? Because Jesus told the story to real people. Are we living like we're just amazed by the fact that he would give us anything, let alone his life, let alone his grace, let alone his adventure, let alone the resources of all of his kingdom? Like, we 
which one do we most identify with? Here's what I want to invite.